Welcome as we finish off our series in the book of Jude on contending for the faith. Contending for what we believe, standing strong, maintaining our walk with Jesus Christ, not turning to the right or to the left, not being taken out, but maintaining and continuing to walk in him. That's the whole goal of this series. And as John mentioned as he was doing some of the opportunities earlier today in the service, he mentioned that yesterday we had this men's breakfast in this room with Bill Butters. And I want to reiterate his story briefly because it fits with what I'm talking about here this morning. And so Bill Butters, back in the, the 70s, he played hockey for the U of M and then played hockey eventually for the North Stars for three years as well. But he grew up in White Bear Lake. It was a time when the University of Minnesota only recruited people from Minnesota to play for them. And Bill Butters grew up in White Bear Lake in a tough home. His dad left him at the age of four. It was him, two older sisters, and his mom. His sister in eighth grade got pregnant. The baby was given away in ninth grade, got pregnant, got married, then got divorced. The other sister in ninth grade ran away from home. And Bill, as this young child, went to church one day with his mom, and they were known in the community, and they were rejected. Bill grew up hating the church. Literally, he hated the church, how they treated his mom and their situation. He's playing hockey. Not great, but he's good. And a referee pulls him aside and says, hey, Billy, you should think of maybe playing college hockey. And he laughs. He's like, I'm not that guy. We don't have that money. I can't play. Two days later, he gets a call from Herb Brooks, coach at the U. He says, hey, I want you to come play for me. And he goes and he plays hockey at the U. And he's known as a brawler. He's, he's a good player, but he's a fighter. And he's known as that. And he gets through and he's playing at the U. He meets his wife at the university and they get married prior to finishing up his degree. And he's married for seven years at this time. And after college, he gets drafted by the Philadelphia Flyers. And so he's playing hockey, but he's known and he's hired as a brawler. He's trying to actually develop his hockey skills and the coach says, what are you doing? We hired you, we recruited you to be a fighter and to cause havoc on the ice. And that's what Bill did. That's what he was known for. That was the reality of it. And so back then, you didn't make a ton of money in the NHL, right? Pro hockey. And so Bill's buddy said, hey, I do these camps in the summer. Would you want to teach kids how to play hockey? And Bill's thinking, well, that's great. You know, he's probably going to pay me and that I can make some money over the summer. That'll be super helpful, you know, off season, right? And then his friend says, but the, the, the key is it's volunteer. And Bill's like, what? You know, of course, it's Christians. They want everything for volunteer, right? You know, of course, that's me. And then and he says, all right, all right, I'll, I'll go. Because his wife says, you know what, you should go. She put it on the calendar, circled it. You're going, right? Because his wife knew Jesus. And the only way that she would marry him is if he would get married in the church. And he said, I hate the church. But if that's what it takes to, to get married, I will marry you in the church. But here's the reality. All the I do's when you get married, she believed. All the I do's, he didn't. And so after marriage, he still went, slept with women, drinking like a madman, doing his own thing, not at home. And they had three kids. So seven years into the marriage, he goes to this camp 
and it's this Christian hockey camp. And he's teaching 12-year-olds how to play hockey. And one day after one of the training sessions, this 12-year-old boy comes up, takes his hockey glove off, extends his hand and says, Coach, that was a great practice. And Bill Butters in his mind said, I have never heard that from a hockey player in my life. <laughs> What's with these kids? He's going to get some lunch, and he sees these kids, 12-year-old boys, sitting around this tree, reading this book. And the boys called him over and said, hey, coach, come on over, Kate, come on over. And, that, and they called him over, he says, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're reading the Bible. And, that, and Bill Butters says to him, I don't even know anybody that owns a Bible. What's that? What's that? And they said, hey, come sit with lunch at, you know, at the table with us for lunch and stuff. And then the next day, one of the kids from that group said, hey, Coach Butters, why, why don't you come to chapel tonight with us? And Bill Butters is like, what's a chapel? What's that? Well, he says it's like church. No, I hate church. No, I ain't coming. Well, that night, he was on a walk, heard these boys singing like crazy. And so he walked by and he peeks in to the chapel to see what was going on. And these 12-year-old boys are singing to Jesus and just so excited and all this stuff, hoopla. And so the next day he decides to go. And he says, hey, I'm going to sit in the back row though. And he gets there and the, the whole back row is filled. And he ends up having to sit down in front. And he sits down in front, and that night, a hockey guy presents clearly what Jesus had done for us on the cross. And he shares this illustration of how in a hockey game, the goalie never gets taken out of the hockey game for a penalty. So if the goalie's getting really ticked off or this or that and the opponent hits him or runs into him and he slashes him with his stick or he punches him in the face or whatever, they never take the goalie out and put him in the penalty box. They choose another player from that team on the ice to go and serve the penalty for the goalie. And in hockey, they call the penalty box the sin bin. And so this guy's sharing this story, and then he says, that is the picture of what Jesus has done for us. Instead of us being put in the penalty box because of our sin, our penalty, God picked Jesus, the perfect son, the perfect player, and he put him in the penalty box, the sin bin, for us. And Bill Butters is like hearing this story. He's bawling like crazy. That night, after the chapel, he's in this small group with 18, 12-year-old boys and a couple counselors. And they're talking about what they heard earlier in chapel. And then at the end, the counselor says, well, let's pray. And Bill gets up and starts walking out, and they're like, no, 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 we're going to like pray. And Bill's like, oh, I thought that was it, you know? Thought that was the prayer, you know, that kind of thing. And they get in a circle and they said, okay, hold hands. And Bill's like holding hands with 12-year-old boys. You know, he's just like, he's this brutal, beat up everybody on the ice guy. Notorious. And he's holding hands with these 12-year-old guys. And all of a sudden, each boy starts praying out loud. Bill's never heard like people pray out loud. And the first boy says, God, thank you for bringing Coach Butters to this camp to teach us. The next boy, God, I pray that you would bring peace into Coach Butters' life. Third kid, God, I pray that Coach Butters would receive your son Jesus as Savior and Lord. And at that moment, Bill Butters lost it. He said he landed on his knees and he received Christ as Savior and Lord. 
he went home from that hockey camp, told his wife what happened, and then confessed to her everything that he had been doing. All the women, all the drinking, all the carousing. And he thought, well, this is the end of that. She put out both palms and she said, I forgive you. Let's allow God to make this marriage what he wants it to be now. And he said, over that time, God transformed their marriage and they've been married 51 years. It's amazing. Soon after that, he decided, man, I got to go to church, get to a church. And in White Bear, where they were living, there was this little church around the corner, First Baptist Church. And so he wanted to get there early. He got there early, he walks in, and there's not many people around yet for service and that. And there's two little old ladies sitting up front talking and visiting. And he walks in the sanctuary, they turn around, and they say, you're Bill Butters. And he says, yes, I am. We've been praying for you for 25 years. <laughs> Literally. Jaw drops. I tell you this story because this is what Jude, at the end of his letter to the church, is telling us. That we are to contend for the faith of others. These 12 year old boys, well, first of all, the, the friend that invited Bill Butters to the camp, but then these 12 year old boys, and then these two women that prayed for Bill Butters for 25 years, all three of them were contending for the faith of Bill Butters. And now, Bill Butters, not only was he not only here yesterday contending for the faith of others, but he travels all over the nation and the world, contending for the faith of others, telling his story, inviting people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is what Jude is communicating to us at the end of his letter called Jude. We see in Jude that he is talking to and talking about three different groups of people. In verses 1 through 16, he's talking about the false teachers. He's body slamming the false teachers. I have a, a picture up here of uh, Elmo body slamming. You know, I, I, I picked Elmo because I think Jude's a pretty good guy, but when it came to false teachers in the church and them trying to take people away from their relationship with Jesus Christ or keep them from knowing Jesus Christ, Jude was a body slammer. He wasn't talking light. We see that in verses 12, just through 15, well, 12 and 13, he body slams the false teachers six times. He's off the rope. Boom! Right? All over him. He says, these people are blemishes at your love fest. Meaning as people got together, had dinner together, fellowship, they were encouraging others. There were these false teachers that came in, didn't believe Jesus Christ, what the church was preaching. And they came in trying to dissuade Christians from following Jesus. He said, eating, they're eating with you without the slightest qualm. They don't care. They don't care about Christ. They just want to pull you away. They're shepherds who feed on themselves. They are clouds without rain. They're fake. Clouds come and they pour down rain and they, they get substance and, and growth and nourishment. And he's saying they're false. Clouds without rain. Blown along in the wind. They're autumn trees that should have fruit by this time, right? But they're without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They're wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame. They brag about their sin, about what's wrong. They're wandering stars from whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Stars don't wander. They stay in their spot. But these wander. And he said, there's a place in hell, the darkest, darkest, reserved for them. 
And so he's body slamming these false teachers. But then secondly, he's building up the believers, us, to contend for our faith against these false teachers. And in verse 17 through 21, he just says, hey, remember, remember to look out for these false teachers. And then he encourages the believers to remain. Remember and remain. Remain in God's love. Remain in walking with him. Just like Jesus said in John 15, 5, right? The vine and the branches. If a man or woman remains in me and I remain in them, they will bear not just little fruit, but he says much fruit. So remain in me. Continue to walk with the Lord on a daily basis through prayer, through reading his word, through being in a small group and fellowship with others, through coming together as the family of God on Sunday, caring and championing one another, right? And so Jude is talking about, first of all, and he's body slamming these false teachers. Then he's building up the church and saying, hey, contend for your faith. Remember and remain. But then lastly, he's challenging the church to contend for the faith of others around you as well. And in these last four verses, and in the last two verses, he talks about how we can confidently contend for the faith of others. But he starts out in verse 22. He says that we need to, first of all, when we contend for the faith of others, we need to be compassionate. He says, be merciful to those who doubt. You see, reality is, around us, there's going to be people who doubt their faith. There's times still after walking with Jesus for 40 plus years that I doubt my faith. There's sometimes where things happen in life where you're just scratching your head and you're just like, God, what about that? I don't get it. Right? And there's individuals around us who are seeking Jesus, who are trying to find him, what the relationship looks like, what it means to give their lives to him as Savior and Lord amidst all the other false teachings in our world, amidst all of the other false religions in our world. And they're doubting and they're searching and they're trying to learn. And Jude says to be merciful towards them or be compassionate. Be understanding. Listen, help them with their questions. They say that for every church to be healthy, that there should be three chairs of people in that church. There should be one third who are not yet Christ followers who are seeking Jesus, who are trying to figure out what is truth. Is he the way, the truth, and the life? Is he the only true and living God? Do I want to give my life to him as Savior and Lord? And they're doubting, they're wondering, they're questioning. And he says, hey, be patient, be compassionate with these individuals. Every church should have a third of the people coming in that chair. The second chair are the new believers. They've recognized, yes, I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. I've given my life to him. And they're continuing to learn and grow in this new relationship with Jesus. And they're going to doubt and have questions. And then there's the third chair, the third of the other people, and that is the mature believers. That Hey, they've been with Jesus for many, 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 many years. They've gone through all kinds of valleys, all kinds of peaks. They've been through God's word. They've been accountable, all these kind of things. And when life hits the fan or whatever, it's hard. But they're steady because of their relationship. It's like my wife and I, Sherry, we've been married 37 years. We are steady. We're steady. We're not newlyweds anymore. And we've gone through thick and thin and all that stuff, but we've remained and we are steady. Right, honey? We're steady. Right? No. <laughs> she would, we're steady. No. <laughs> but we're steady. I mean, I have no question about our marriage, about our love for me, whatever. Zero. And it's awesome. Right? But that's the health of a church, having those three chairs, right? 
But Judah's saying, hey, you got to be compassionate. You got to be merciful to people who doubt. Just walk with them, be patient. Help them answer their questions. Share your own personal story and your walk with Christ. And then he goes on from there. He says, hey, you need to be compassionate. But secondly, you need to be concerned. And so he goes on in verse 22 and he says, save others by snatching them from the fire. Save others from snatching them from the fire. So we move from being compassionate, where people have doubts, to being concerned. There are individuals in our lives, around us, in our community, that are in the fire. Their lives and how they are living are leading to destruction. And we are called to save them from the fire. The, the description here, the picture here is like running into a burning building and pulling them out. Pulling them out. I love the picture we get in Colossians 3, 16 and Romans 15, 14, where this little phrase, it says, admonish one another in love. That word admonish literally means this. When you see a friend, a neighbor, co-worker, heading down a road of destruction, you know that this is going to hurt, it's going to take them out, it's going to end badly, that because you love them, you are going to take the risk to go and stand in front of them and say, no, stop, this isn't good. And you're going to try to pull them out of the fire. And that is what Jude is saying here. Be concerned. There's a time where, hey, we can be compassionate and that, and there's just people who are questioning and seeking God in that. But then there's times to be concerned where we got to pull people out of the fire because their lives are heading towards destruction. There was an interesting news article back in the day, 1985, written out of New Orleans. There was a party held at the municipal pool in New Orleans to celebrate that there was no drownings in all of the pools that year in New Orleans. And so at this big municipal pool, there were 200 guests and there were 100 certified lifeguards. And at the end of the night, as the four lifeguards on duty were encouraging people to end the party, get out of the pool, they found a fully dressed man at the bottom of the deep end. Jeremy Moody, 31 and they couldn't revive him. He had drowned, surrounded by lifeguards, lifeguards celebrating their successful season. And I say this to us. We have all kinds of people in Isani County drowning who need us to rescue them to contend for their faith. Just like those 12-year-olds, just like those two ladies for 25 years contended for the faith of Bill Butters. There are people all around this county who need us to contend for their faith because they're drowning. And some of them are like Jeremy, who didn't make it. And so Jude challenges us and he says, listen, it's just not about contending for your own faith. It's all about me. I'm in this bubble. No. It's also about contending for the faith of others. So he says, be compassionate, be concerned. But then he gives this warning and he says, be cautious as well. Be cautious as well. Verse 23, the second half says this. To others, show mercy mixed with fear. Mixed with fear. Hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Boy, those are strong words. 
He says, show them mercy, but with fear. Meaning, there's a group of people that you want to show mercy to, but you have to be careful with. You have to approach them mixed with fear. It's sort of this idea, hey, you have to run in and you want to save them from the fire, right? But when you run in to save them from the fire, you have to be careful that you don't get burned yourself. So there's this group of people that are deep within sin, deep within destruction, that you need to be careful that when you run in to try to pull them out, you're not pulled in yourself. Get it? Understand? So that if you're struggling with pornography, but you're working at it, and it's going well in that, and you know a group of your guys at work of this that are struggling with pornography, you got to really think hard, am I going to go in and try to pull them out of the fire? Because can I pull them out of the fire without getting burnt out myself at this stage of my life? Or whatever the scenario or situation is. Going up to the casino gambling, hey, get out of there, you guys, and then you're pulled in, whatever it might be, right? Because there are just some tough, tough situations. We have this uh, saying on our refrigerator, and it says this: No matter how bad you want some, no matter how bad you want better for someone, until they want better for themselves. There's nothing you can do except pray. And I'd put this in the cautious category. Because there's some people in our lives that they just don't want it. They're not interested. They don't care what the fire is like. They don't care how hot it is. They don't care how close they are to destruction. And as much as you've loved them and cared for them and tried to lead them, plead with them, they don't care. And so you got to back off. And Jude says, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. I mean, life has gotten so bad in that, that it like, it just is this destruction is oozing out of them. You can see, obviously it's affecting them, but yet they're not interested. And you got to just be cautious. And pray, God, I can't go in, or I've tried to go in, not interested, and so I need you to send someone else to go in. Send somebody else to go in and figure out and pull this person out because you've called me to be cautious. And so Jude is challenging us at the end of this time his letter to the church to contend for the faith of others, to be compassionate, to be concerned, but yet to be cautious. But I love what he says at the end, the last two verses, but he reminds us that, hey, in our walk with Jesus Christ, and as we contend for the faith of others, we can walk with confidence. We can be confident. He says in verse 24, 25, he says this in Jude. To him who is able to keep you and me from stumbling as we contend for the faith of others and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and without great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all the ages, now and forevermore. And we know that in Matthew 28, when Jesus commissioned the disciples, he says, hey, all authority has been given to me above you know, heaven and on earth, and that's so why I'm sending you. Basically, I'm giving you now all this authority. And so this, this majesty, this power, this authority, Jesus has put upon us to be compassionate, to be concerned, yet be cautious, but to go and contend for the faith of others and say, hey, if you go and you remain in me, I will keep you from stumbling. And you will bear much fruit. You will see people 
come to know me. I love the story of the young soldier who after high school signed up to go into the military. He went into the barracks the first night and he did what, he's, what he always did growing up at home. He knelt down by his bed to do his nightly prayer before bed. And the other peers, soldiers in the barracks were laughing at him and sneering as they were gambling and looking at their girly magazines and all that stuff. And they were throwing their boots at him while he's praying and all that kind of stuff. And, and the next day he went and he talked to the chaplain. And he said, chaplain, I don't, I don't know what to do. You know, I, these, these guys are just, you know, brutalizing me and they're, they just hate it when I'm praying. What should I do? And the chaplain said, well, you know, you don't have to kneel down and, and pray in front of them. That you, you know, you can lay in your bread, pray silently. You know, just do that. Well, it was a few weeks later and the young soldier ran into the chaplain again. And the chaplain says, hey, well, how's it going? How's, how's that working for you? And the young man said, you know what? I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. After three days, I had to be who I am. And so I got out and I kneeled down next to my bed and I prayed regardless. And he said, you know what? Now every night at that time, we have a prayer meeting in the barracks. And two of my fellow soldiers became Christians and now we're praying for the rest. And there is a picture of one who is contending not only for his own faith, maintaining and walking with Jesus and not being ashamed of his relationship with him, but also contending for the faith of others. The beautiful things. So when we contend for the faith of others, we need first of all to reflect Christ in our lives, and then we need to go out and be compassionate. We need to be concerned. We need to be cautious. But we always need to walk in confidence because who we are in Jesus Christ and that he wants us to be used to contend for the faith of others, to bring others like those 12-year-olds and those two little ladies and Bill Butter's friend contended for his life. The Washington Monument was erected in 1885. It was dedicated a day before George Washington's birthday. A hundred years later in 1994, there was a restoration project done on the monument. And they uncovered this quote on the back end of the Washington Monument. It said this, whoever is the human instrument under God in the conversion of one soul, erects a monument to his own memory more lofty and enduring than this. Wow. Because what those 12 year old boys did and those two little old ladies and his buddy is they erected a monument, a life that is not just going to last as cement and stone, but is going to last for eternity. And that is why Jude at the end of his letter to the church says, listen, Look out for these false teachers. Contend, stand strong for your faith, but don't stay in your holy huddles. Don't hide yourself in the church or your home. Go out and contend for the faith of others. Contend for your community. Contend for your county. And that is my challenge for you, New Hope, that we contend for the faith of others around us. And that we are passionate, we're concerned, we're cautious, but man, we walk in confidence because Jesus Christ lives in us. Let's pray.
Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that it's clear. Lord, those who are here who know you as Savior and Lord, somebody contended for them. I know for my wife, Sherry, and I, there were others who were contending for our faith. For myself, Dave Walton, Aaron Williams, contending for my faith. And so I praise you and thank you. And I pray favor over each one here as we go out in confidence and seek to bring others into a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.